don't be anxious or nervous that you're not doing enough. As long as each of us is flowing the highest possible energy of goodness, that's all we can do. And if we all flow it, then we've done what we can do in this lifetime. another climate emergency forum. So once again, we have special guests, Reese Halter, and our topic is bees, trees, and seas, defend or die. So I say welcome to fellow defenders. Once again, this is part two, and we're very much looking forward to hearing uh, what Reese has to share with us. So Reese, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, the, the first image I want to bring to your attention uh, is a uh, tree graveyard. It's uh, forestry is bar none, one of the most shocking, underhanded, crafty, subsidized, uh, multinational messes on planet Earth. We can thank the rotten, stinking bankers of the world for funding this. The shocking thing to me of net zero, which absolutely is bullshit because uh, both Paris and the COPs and all countries are under some horrible illusion that if we burn nature's greatest carbon storehouses, that sometime Oh, in the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years, there will be a magical machine that will suck all of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and it'll be happy days so that we can have more plastic out our yin-yang. The main thing, which is bunkum of that, is none of these purported experts have said boo on the energy of the ocean the heat in the ocean. The oceans drive our climate. And we have turbocharged the oceans. Seven Hiroshima-style atomic bombs of heat every second of the year from combustion heat. We need a zero combustion global economy 2030. 2030, electrify everything. In the meantime, burning little wooden pellets has become a little big giant banker's delight from 2 million tons a year to 60 million tons. I cut my teeth in British Columbia and uh, cut carbon, not trees. Uh, next image are these wood pellets. Uh, I cut my teeth in British Columbia almost 40 years ago in formal tree training and it was inconceivable. It takes by car from Vancouver to the Alaska border approximately 44 hours of driving through spectacular mountains and valleys and different forest types and in that 40 years the forest industry has literally leveled almost that entire area. There's 1.3 million hectares, almost 4 million acres of old growth in the inland rainforest. And the wood pellet industry has set their sight on pelletizing everything. And they are. And uh, Drax is in there, the second biggest pelletizer in the world. There's eight other British Columbia pelletizers. And the British Columbia chief forester who sets the rules and okayed the pellets, guess where she is today? She's a vice president of Drax. The thing is sordid and ugly and awful. And by the way, when you burn a pellet of wood, it releases 13% more greenhouse gas heat per unit than coal. 
There's nothing sustainable about burning these masterpieces that keep getting better as they get older. There are over 25,000 bees. The honeybee is from Africa, but the one we use globally at any one moment, there's 1.5 trillion comes from Italy. They are so unique. Let me just give you a rundown. Honeybees can count. Honeybees can recognize a human face. Honeybees are thrill seekers. Honeybees get depressed. Honeybees learn while they're asleep. Honeybees dream while they're asleep. Honeybees mourn the loss of a loved one and they share their neurons, their brain neurons. They have about a million. We have about 16 billion. Their brain neuron, a human brain neuron, an orca, the largest dolphin brain neuron, and an elephant brain neuron are absolutely identical. The difference is the combination the, and the degree of combination that separates the four most socially complex uh, species that we're aware of on Earth. These are incredible creatures. A friend of mine that was working our apple tree here, uh, they, they live for six weeks. They fly themselves to death. Their wings wear out after 500 miles of flying. If you have a teaspoon of honey, that's the culmination of a dozen bees and their entire lifetime of flying and uh, nectaring and pollinating. And I will say this, they make a, a special glue uh, for their hive uh, with the wax that they make and the enzyme from their mouth and the tree resin. It may very well be the most powerful natural medicine on earth. It's called propolis. If you ever get a sore throat, propolis takes it away in, oh, less than three seconds. And for men who suffer from prostate cancer, they're now using propolis as a, a co-treatment. If you've got uh, cold sores, herpes, uh, oral herpes, at least a billion people on earth do, the propavir anointment stops it cold in its tracks. It's remarkable. The bees are remarkable. And by the way, I said there were 25,000 bees in the world today. We're missing five thousand species. The main culprit, the climate and crisis for sure, the agricultural land destruction for sure, introduced diseases and pests for sure, but bar none, make no mistake, the amount of nerve poisons that this human race is putting on our planet at 1.2 billion kilos per annum for the last 30 years has laid the bees, the birds, the worms, the dragonflies, uh, the fish, the frogs, the shellfish to waste. The poisons are sophisticated today. The seeds are dunked. The plant uh, discerns their poison. Plants differ from humans, not so much except that in their cell, they have a, a big space called the vacuole and they dump poisons in the vacuole. They recognize it as poisons. They push these nerve poisons through their flowers that the bees come in contact with. And when they dehiss, when they fall onto the ground or the soil, uh, organisms, organisms come into contact with it and water carries it into fresh water. When the bees come in contact with these nerve poisons, less than two dozen parts per billion, they lose their minds and shake to death as though they have got full strength Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's enough to make you vomit on the spot. We have lost trillions of bees. We continue to do this. And by the way, Paul Stamets and his mycology group in the Northwest, a uh, little north of me, we have nature's medicine. We have a concoction of pre-sporulating mushrooms that Paul helps people. They can, the farmers can do it for free or you can buy the extract from them. They put it on the land. Guess what? The plants are fine. They're strong. And the insects are there. And the plants are unpalatable. 
for the insects. Let me remind you, you take all the insects and you take all 8 billion humans and you put them on a balance, 17 times more weight in the insect world than all the humans. The insects on the land are the glue of the land. We're in an insect Armageddon, we're missing zillions of them. And as a result, 41% of the insects are missing. As a result, 40% of the birds are missing. People may say, oh, birds, yeah, they're kind of nice. I like to hear them. Well, they're a little bit more than nice. The birds, they're keepers of the forest and grasslands. They spread seeds. The birds are very central to life on our planet these poisons are off the chart. The main plants, process oils you want to be aware of, canola, rapeseed, sunflower, or safflo oil, they're slathered in these neonicotinoids, sulfaxiflores, and the next generation nerve poisons. You don't want to eat them. Please don't eat them. Please don't eat them. In America, these foolhardy, crazy nut jobs have got it in outdoor decking wood. They've got it in glue, like the PCBs they put in caulking glue in the day 40 years ago. They've got these nerve poisons in sidings. They've got them in places people are breathing. I fervently believe in part, much like the Romans went mad with uh, wine and pewter and lead in the goblets, we're going mad from all these poisons that people are eating. We see blue bees. These are headbangers. They actually pull into a, uh, the stamen and knock their head so hard, dislodge the pollen. They perform what's called buzz pollination or sonification. If you like tomatoes and you like peppers or you like gourds, which I do, these native sonification uh, critters are what we need. The bumblebee is what we use. They don't have bumblebees in the Southern Hemisphere, or they're not supposed to. They're not native. These bees perform an extraordinary situation. The next bee, you know, there's 25,000 bees. Hello, here's a, a neotropical bee of Latin America that's carnivorous. That's right. The reason the bee goes to the pollen, they collect the pollen for protein. They take the po protein back. They feed it to their young for brains and their immune system. These creatures feed on carrion. Uh, they do not uh, use pollen. They fulfill two exquisite roles on the triangle. They're both a producer and they're a decomposer. They, they help decompose the animals. Remarkable. They have little teeth. They take the carrion back and they put it in a waxen pot and it literally stews for two weeks uh, from the acid in their gut breaking down the nutrients and the protein, and then they take that protein, mix it with honey, we call that bee bread, and give it to the larvae. Oh my god. Uh, next slide is the bedlam. If it isn't wood chips in British Columbia, the death knell of nature's great carbon scrubbers, it's these rotten subsidized gas lines. Uh, the, the battle that uh, we've been following is in the north, the coastal gas link. This is fracking. This is unbelievable. There are tens, tens of thousands of abandoned fracking mines. The fracking, for those that are unaware, cracks the crust. It lets the gas rise up. It also poisons the groundwater that way, but they have to pump a fluid in and out of the well. They poison the groundwater. Every two and a half miles of these pipelines leaks gas. This is an odorless, colorless gas, liquefied natural gas. It's a gas in the pipeline. Uh, when it gets to Kitimat, uh, LNG Canada is the uh, behemoth there. When it gets there, it's a liquid in the pipe. It becomes a gas in Kitimat for the boats to take across to Asia. When it gets to Asia, they liquefy it again and put a scent in it so it stinks, so they know if there's a leak, look out. And it's all subsidized. It's disgusting in Canada and elsewhere. In Canada, TransCanada Piper, they've rebranded themselves as such nonsense, the Calgary Petroleum Club goons. They have the RCMP guarding and kicking in doors and beating uh, defenders 
indigenous people who have the right and haven't conceded right to the gas link to be on their land. And let me tell you how they deal with the defenders. They play music on a decibel, like a 747. They blare it. These are nasty, brutal goons that literally beat the defenders into the ground. It's horrible. I tip my hat, next slide, to these brave defenders. And look at the next image. The Amazon, if it isn't bad enough, it's burning or it's droughted to death. If that isn't bad enough, you may say, oh, it's the soy they're making for Bunge and uh, Cargill and the other awful entities for animal agriculture. Oh, it's the timber looting. Oh, no, it isn't. All that red, that's oil, ladies and gentlemen. That's fracking and they're bulldozing the greatest tropical rainforest for God damn oil, subsidized oil. This is a rout. If that doesn't make you sick, the next image will. This is industrial fisheries. This is a super trawler that sort of kind of had a little accident. Its net broke and uh, millions of uh, bycatch and fish just went into the water. My brothers and sisters at Sea Shepherd, which is very close to my heart, these are some of the bravest individuals on planet Earth. Not only are the dozen Sea Shepherd boats vegan. <laughs> you want to get on that boat, you sign a waiver. Are you willing to die for the whales? If you don't sign your name, you don't get on that boat. You get on that boat as a volunteer, you pay your way for food. This was one of the bravest situations I have ever been involved and seen in my entire life. That, the Nishumaru, was the illegal Japanese whaler in an international whaling zone trying to illegally refuel with the South Korean refueler uh, on the left. That's Bob Barker. He's a lovely, lovely human. He loves our planet. He donated that boat. That boat got between the Nishimaru and the uh, South Korean tanker, and it got squished. And we thought we were dead. And that is in the Great Southern Ocean, 3,000 miles away from anything. If we would have gone down, we would have died. The water is two, three degrees C. Oh my, these are miniature blue whales. You know, we need the whales, apart from they are our brothers and sisters, the whales are extraordinary at doing two things. The whales and the amount of the phytoplankton they consume and krill they consume, they store carbon. They store enough carbon that the uh, World Bank estimated that all the whales are worth in people dollars, a trillion dollars alive. Uh, they store it, they go to the bottom of the ocean and all the worms and all the little creatures on the bottom turn that carbon into stored carbon in the bottom, which industrial fishing is destroying. The other thing that the whales do is the whales are shepherds of the sea. Their flocculent fecal plumes provide fertilizer, iron, and nitrogen for the phytoplankton. Oh, yes. You may have heard that forests are the lungs of the planet. Not so. Three out of every four breaths comes from our oceans, from the mats of phytoplankton, the lush, plush mats that feed and grow and have almost all the fisheries larvae in there. They rely on the cold currents that upwell carrying uh, iron and nitrogen to the surface as their fertilizers, but the heat in the ocean has stopped that energy, those nutrients from rising. We're missing 40% of the phytoplankton. The whales are trying to grow it back. And there's an even bigger story here, which is heartbreaking. Inside of the phytoplankton, there's something called Prochlorococcus. Prochlorococcus is a blue-green bacteria. Prochlorococcus is the largest photosynthetic surface on planet Earth and it provides almost 20% of the oxygen that we breathe that's in our atmosphere and the heartbreak, the microplastics are starting to inhibit the prochlorococcus from generating oxygen. It's a heartbreak. 
when it rains, it pours cats and dogs. For every one degree centigrade, the atmosphere holds 7% more moisture. In my second home away from home in Australia, they've just undergone in northern New South Wales, three horrendous climate floods in the last five weeks, where in some areas, and I kid you not, six meters of rain accumulated, six meters of rain, average two meters in a couple towns. The towns, uh, some of them will not come back. We've got climate refugees in a G20 country. With the heat in the ocean, uh, amongst uh, everything, uh, the acidity, which is horrible, shells are melting in the ocean. These are deoxygenated zones, uh, some from runoff, from animal agriculture, others from the heat in the ocean actually deoxygenating the water. We have to be so careful. The next image is an ice storm. These climate storms are coming hard and fast. Next image is uh, back to the apple. Look, I urge everyone to become a vegan. It's the single biggest thing you can do right this very second to make a dent and to be kind to the animal population. People say, oh, I can't do that. The problem on our planet is habitual. You can do anything. If you want to, you can change. Is it an all or nothing? No. Try one day a week, then go to two days a week. You will find you can do it. The apples are but one of the great fruits. Everyone should have at least a couple food bearing trees in their yard, have a, a raised bed, grow your own food, get your children back into their food security. Next image is one of the giant sequoias, uh, my little brother on one of our pilgrimages, just getting back to the basics, the protection of all ancient trees. It is so vital that every big tree we lose lessens our chance that we will survive. They make up 1% of all the trees on the planet, yet they hold 50% of the above ground carbon. They accumulate 70% on average in the last half of their life. Some species, there's 72,000 kinds of trees, some 40% in the last quarter of their life. They must be protected. Do not fall into the trap of saying, oh, we can plant 8 billion seedlings. A seedling isn't even a sapling and a sapling isn't even a grown up tree. They can't remove and store the carbon that the mature ones can. Lastly, I will say this, please study history, 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 history. In World War II in 1940, when Winston Churchill took over, watch the movie Darkest Hour. At the beginning of the war, it was very bad. It was the Brits were being handed their ass. They, hundreds of thousands were dying. And the British intelligence came up with a term, illegitimous non carborundum. Don't let the bastards <laughs> grind you down. Mahatma Gandhi, bless him, he put it a little more eloquently. What we each do seems insignificant, but it is most important that we do it. And do it by our, the way we eat. Do it by refusing to consume crap. Refuse plastics. Use glass. Be frugal because it's good to be frugal and love the animals, be kind to the animals and join a direct action conservation group because there's like-minded people, there's strength in number because ladies and gentlemen, together, we are an unstoppable force for goodness and we can do this. We must do this. It's our survival. Thank you. One question then, Reese. The scientists have actually been saying for many years and also the environmental organizations. Occasionally, <laughs> they've been saying that, as you're saying, that uh, this is a question of, of our survival. So my question is, wh why aren't we afraid at all? I mean, why aren't we even afraid for our children? What's happened to us? You mentioned the insect apocalypse. I mean, that got lots of coverage in the media. And my God, the insects are disappearing. I mean, that's bloody dramatic, right? 
Why, why aren't we afraid of this? Hubris, in the first part of this show, the concern came up with money and monetizing everything. The internet has become one massive tool to, to manipulate. In my uh, second last book, Gen Z Emergency, I pointed some pretty hard fingers. There's one person I absolutely loathe. On. I don't loathe too many people, but I certainly loathe uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. There's no question of that. You can see that for the last 10 years. The concern is when I, the dolphins, you know, dolphins mourn when they lose a loved one. Dolphins have a language. Very interestingly, Carl Sagan famously said, it's in uh, Shepherding the Sea, one of my books. He, he said, isn't it interesting, bless him. He said, isn't it interesting how the dolphins have learned some 50 uh, human words and humans have learned no dolphinese. Well, the interesting thing is uh, my colleagues in Sydney have made communication with the dolphins by uh, using uh, uh, music, flute music and operatic music. So we're starting to learn the language. Everything has a language. We've been remiss. But when I think of dolphins, I think of the emergency because there's a freshwater skin disease. It's raining so intensely in Australia, around the coastlines and America, that it's desalinating the coastal waters so quickly that the dolphin's skin cells burst and they're covered from their rostrum to their fluke, from their nose to their tail in burn-like cancers. They're climate victims. And we seem not to feel like we should be concerned. We should be terrified. I'm terrified. I know you and I speak of this. I think we need to pull our heads up out of the sand. And like an addict, when an addict looks in a mirror and says, I'm fucked, help, then there are many solutions. We're addicted and we refuse to admit we're addicted to sociopathic consumption, which is given more depression, more anxiety, more burnout, and more suicide than ever before. That makes a whole lot of sense, Reese. It really, really does. And I'm going to pass on to our colleague, Paul Beckwith, and ask him to uh, have a discussion with you, Reese. You know, when we think of all of this, you know, everything that's going on that you've mentioned, it can be extremely overwhelming. So I think it's important that we as individuals come up with ways to function and to try to make a difference and to continue to do our work to get the message out uh, to the world on the ravages that we're performing to our planet. And it's dire. Like, how do we get countries to cooperate more? Because this is a huge tragedy of the commons sort of situation. And it's very, very difficult to get climate action and to get action to preserve the biosphere in times of peace. And yet with climate change proceeding, I can easily see uh, global food shortages yeah. uh, from climate change alone and then throw on geopolitical conflicts like, you know, wars and or pandemics, things that cut supply lines. And we're right up against the wall. People don't realize how close we are to uh, global food shortages. So what do we do? Musk wants to go to Mars, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I mean, we have to preserve our own planet. It's the only thing that we have. So thank you for all of your great work and efforts. And we don't focus enough on the seas. I mean, we live on the land. Yet I think in terms of carbon capture, the seas are probably one of the best places to get large carbon capture. So have you considered or looked into the ideas of things like ocean pasture restoration, just restoring the phytoplankton to restoring ocean marine life all the way up the food chain to store vast amounts of carbon? Well, I'm aware the difficulty in repairing these systems now, Paul, or the reality is the heat the deoxygenation, the acidity. There are monoculture, like replanting kelp, and I'm aware of the different situations. But I honestly think that the, the step one is to end all 
not only fossil fuel subsidies, six trillion direct and indirect annually, but also the 35 billion directly into the fisheries. I honestly think we have to get out of the ocean altogether. Now, people will say, oh, you know, there's no way. There's every way, because if we went to a plant-based diet, which is extraordinarily doable, instead of monoculture corn and monoculture soy, which is fed to animals, which takes an inordinate amount of energy and water is wasteful and toxic, both for the animals, the people, and the runoff into the ocean. Now, how we do that, I'm really not sure because of, of the money, but I will say this, that every year that goes on, all this bottom trawling that is kicking up all of the stored carbon, and the longer that goes on, the less chance we really have. It's hard. Noam Chomsky, if you've seen his latest video, he's of the opinion that we've well crossed the line. He said, not everybody will die. And I don't mean to be macabre by saying this. I'm only repeating what he said. He said, but the, the lucky ones will die quickly. And, and we need to be very, very aware of that. I can't think of anything more precious than life. And it, time is of the essence. Enjoy every day. In fact, I urge everyone to do as many kind acts not because there's a greater later, but because it's the right thing to do and to inspire people just with your acts. And it's enough to do that. Don't be anxious or nervous that you're not doing enough. As long as each of us is flowing the highest possible energy of goodness, that's all we can do. And if we all flow it, then we've done what we can do in this lifetime. That's so powerful what you just shared, Reese. When you quoted Gandhi, do what you can, but we have to do what we have to do, regardless yeah. of the outcome. Yeah, because it's important. And because you listen to yourself, you know, when we're quiet, and I meditation's a fancy word. I like breathing. <laughs> Particularly, I've got a bit of asthma situation. So take five minutes. You ever notice a pussycat? Pussycats are pretty clever. Although I'm not a feline chap, I, I, I do have a penchant for canines. But you know what I like about cats? They're always stretching. I'm an old guy. You know what I try to do whenever I think about it? Stretch. The other thing is just breathe. And when you breathe and sit quietly, Listen after your breath, listen to what your inner self tells you. We all know intuitively what's right. Just listen, follow your heart. Yeah, I think that is so important. I agree, um, especially for those of us who are involved in this very important quest to do whatever we can to save the planet. I just want to say one thing, you know, the whole issue of life. When I was younger, I found life everywhere. After a rain, I would go for a walk and there would be tadpoles in the water. And I knew that tadpoles would turn into frogs, but I don't see tadpoles anymore. I know. The, where are they? And then as you say, the beautiful, beautiful relatives of ours in the ocean. I mean, for God's sakes, we're hand feeding the manatees so they don't starve to death. This is so yeah. hard. It, it's, it's hard. And, you know, Peter made a great point. I'd like to leave on this. It's super, super, super important for humans to realize that all life feels pain. A worm, what a, an untrained person may think of as a lowly earthworm, feels pain. That lowly earthworm, by the way, is able to regenerate itself. Earthworms are the unsung plowmen of our planet. Earthworms eat microbes. In the warming world, our soils are panting more. They're respiring, they're growing more microbes. Earthworms eat those microbes. A field that has earthworms drains 10 times faster. A field that has earthworms grows 25% more bounty. Earthworms bring air. They circulate nutrients. They're food for the birds. Earthworms are everything. The nerve poisons are killing the earthworms. Glyphosate, Roundup, is evil. It's killing 
earthworms and all soil life. We know this and govern yourself accordingly. Thank you for that. And I really, really appreciate you um, bringing up the nerve toxins. And it does bring to mind, you know, we have this, I don't know if, if it's more than ever or just more diagnosed, but this, <gasps> this idea that Asperger syndrome and these various neuro issues are, a lot of people are saying it's because of vaccines, but I really do wonder um, how much of this has to do with these things that we're putting on the food. And, and I'm wondering, I see Dr. Carter uh, ra- uh, nodding his head as well. And I'm wondering if he has anything to add to it or, or Paul as well. I mean, we, we talk right now about chemical warfare being banned, you know, in treaties banning chemical warfare. And what we're doing with these neurotoxins and other chemicals that we add to our food is we're all shooting ourselves in the foot. This is a form of chemical warfare that is accepted by society. We don't call it chemical warfare. We call it preservatives or additives or whatever you want, but it's basically causing tremendous harm to us. We do so so many things that an outside observer would say, well, these these people don't deserve to, to stay on this planet that they're on. Peter, do you have any thoughts about the nerve toxin? Yeah, 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 Regina, I do. I go back a long way into my work on, um, environmental health. And at that time, there were a lot of us who were very aware and very concerned. I mean a lot. And a fair amount of uh, public opinion that we had a huge problem with respect to something that we'd relatively not long recognized, which was called pollution. It was called pollution. And we became aware of it because of the toxins that Paul has just mentioned, and also that that you've told us about, Reese, And there was, there was a feeling um, that it was a really, really good challenge to uh, research all these toxins, potential toxins, see how dangerous they were, see how much disease they were causing, and then work out, could we tolerate the toxins at all? Or if we could, could we regulate them down to very, very small amounts? And we were fairly successful. We were fairly successful. But today, I think the awareness has really disappeared a lot. I don't hear people conscious of a huge problem of pollution. Then we regarded that as pollution of our bodies. We regarded, uh, you know, one and the same. We're literally swimming in, in toxins now. Water, air, what we eat, everywhere. I can't understand why that used to be a scary idea decades ago, and it seems that it's no longer a, a scary idea now. So um, I know, in fact, I know that they're causing a huge, huge amount of ill health to all of our health systems. But most worryingly, I guess, you know, to the system that sort of we value the most as human beings, you know, which is our, our brain and nervous system. And uh, of course, I remember decades ago when, uh, you know, the research discovered that uh, there were toxins in breast milk. That was so scary. And then I remember a few years later that toxins were found in the amniotic fluid of pregnant women. And that was so scary. But also there was a certain sort of evil thought to it that we would allow these toxins, dangerous substances into mother's milk. And then we would allow them into the amniotic fluid. I mean, the worst pollution of all, of course, is atmospheric greenhouse gas pollution. I think pollution is a very, very, very important idea. Absolutely agree. I want to leave these last few minutes for any final words that Reese has to offer us. I would say just further to what uh, Peter said of pollution, what comes to mind is uh, each working day, there's 12,000 new man-made chemicals registered in the American uh, chemistry registry. Uh, Look on the Great Barrier Reef, the endangered sea turtles are covered in herpes and cancers and malformed lungs. The polar bears have hundreds of unknown chemicals in their bloodstream. And the Great Barrier Reef has thousands of chemicals that are unknown to science, we assume they've been registered. It's off the charts. The regulators have failed us. 
the bidders, we call them K Street here, the bidders for the big business uh, run the governments. It's a shocking mess. I've told Peter this before, I'm not ashamed to say it. I am ashamed to be a human being, knowing what we're doing and knowing that these bankers and oligarchs uh, have got hundreds of thousands of shell companies. The poor bastards don't understand a simple thing. You can't eat money and you can't take it with you. You can't drink it. It's not water. This has been so, well, it's been many things. It's been very very difficult. It's been incredibly difficult, but it's been very informative. And at the same time, you've offered us so much hope. And uh, I really appreciate that. And I'm sure that our audience does as well. And Reese brought up so much information. So if you'd like to share this with your friends who could learn more about what's happening with the oceans, the forest, please share it with your friends. And at the same time, like and subscribe this video. It helps us tremendously Thank you so much for joining us, everyone out there. Thank you, Reese. And we'll see you all next time at the next Climate Emergency Forum.